Sometimes we see, feel, smell, taste, or hear things that make us remember different memories. We call these triggers. Triggers can make us feel good, bad, and everything in between. Sometimes it can be the smell of our favorite foods that remind us of a special holiday or celebration, or hearing a song on the radio that makes us remember someone we care about, seeing an old friend and remembering all the fun things we used to do together. But when we experience things about injustice, inequality, racism, and discrimination, like you'll read in this book, it is very normal for our hearts and minds to feel angry, afraid, sad, frustrated, overwhelmed, hopeless, or even inspired to do something about what you read. Your heart might beat a little faster. Your face might feel a little hot. Your body might shake or feel like you want to cry. All these things are normal. If you ever feel this way throughout listening to this book or interacting with discussions, take a minute to take a break. Take a break from the audio, video, and your computer. Focus on what is around you. Feel free to stand up, take a seat, or lie down. Take a few deep breaths and remind yourself, in this moment right now, I am safe. My thoughts and emotions are valid. Read with an open heart and mind. If you feel like focusing on the book audio or video is difficult, feel free to reach out for support from a staff member. We're here to process these complicated thoughts and feelings with you. We are here for you. Chapter 11, Mass Communication for Mass Emancipation. I had a friend, let's call him Mike. He was six foot five and an easy 300 pounds, a football player. I'd watch him truck people on the field, watched him put parents' children on gurneys, all in the name of school pride and athletic victory. I'd watched him grunt and spit and slap himself around like a beast, and we cheered for him, said his name in the morning announcements, wrote about him in the school paper, even held an in-school press conference when he committed to playing football in college. But many of us cheered for him for other reasons, because he also was part of the tap dance club because he played Santa Claus in the winter play, because he took creative writing classes with me to explore his love of poetry, because he spoke out against the mistreatment of young women in our school and stood up for classmates who were being bullied. Mike didn't always get it right, but he was always open to learning and was never afraid, afraid to try. The abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison was like that, a man with power and privilege not afraid to try. But before we get to him, we have to address one of the greatest series of coincidences that led to him that led him to become a central figure in the conversation around race and abolitionism. Coincidence number one. Both Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, president number two before Jefferson, died on July 4th, 1826, on the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. Instead of people seeing this double death as a sign that the old ways of doing things were out of style, literally dead, people looked at their deaths as some kind of encouragement to carry out their legacies. It just so happens those legacies were deeply entwined with slavery. Boston had grown to nearly 60,000 people and was fully immersed in New England's Industrial Revolution, which was now running on the wheels of Southern cotton. Coincidence number two. Though the revolutionary abolitionist movement was practically dead, Robert Finley's American Colonization Society was still functioning at full throttle, trying to get freed slaves to go back to Africa and set up their own colony. The ACS had asked a 23-year-old firebrand named William Lloyd Garrison to give their 4th of July address in 1829. Garrison was the man. He was smart and forward-thinking and worked as an editor of a Quaker-run abolitionist newspaper. But the ACS didn't know that Garrison had gone even further to the side of abolitionism, not colonization. He favored a gradual abolition, a freedom in steps, but abolition nonetheless. And that's what he spoke about at the ACS conference, which, let's just say, was a little off-brand like someone speaking at a Nike conference, suggesting that the future of better running wasn't better sneakers, but better feet. And Nike should figure out how to make better feet. Garrison wasn't the only man who felt this way 
about abolishing slavery, not sneakers, and was unafraid to speak out against colonization. David Walker was another. Walker was a black man, and he had written a pamphlet, an appeal to the colored citizens of the world, arguing against the idea that black people were made to serve white people. Walker's appeal spread. Garrison read it, and eventually the two men met. But before they could really start making a mess of slavery, Walker, just 33 years old, died of tuberculosis. Garrison was influenced greatly by Walker's ideas and carried them on, spreading them by doing what everyone had done before him, literature, writing, language. The only difference was that Garrison's predecessors in propaganda always spread damaging information, at least about black people. They'd always printed poison, narratives about black inferiority and white superiority. But Garrison would buck that trend and start a newspaper, The Liberator. The name alone was a match strike. This paper relaunched the abolitionist movement among white people. In his first editorial piece, Garrison changed perspectives from gradual abolition to immediate abolition, meaning he used to believe that freedom was incremental, a little bit at a time, a slow walk. Now he believed that freedom should be instant, Freedom right now, immediately, break the chains, period. But, because there's always a but, immediate equality, well, that was a different story. And according to Garrison, should be in steps, gradual. So, physical freedom now, but social freedom, eventually. This idea of gradual equality was rooted in the same principles of uplift suasion. Blacks were seen as scary, and it was their responsibility to convince white people that they weren't. At least, this is what Garrison believed. But this idea was challenged by a man who disagreed with not only the idea of gradual equality, but also the idea that black people needed white people to save them, or that they, black people, were part of the problem at all. His name was Nat Turner. He was a slave and a preacher, and just as slave owners before the Enlightenment era believed slavery was a holy mission, Turner believed the same was true for freedom. That he was called upon by God to plan and execute a massive crusade, an uprising that would free slaves, and in so doing, would leave slave masters, their wives, and even their children slaughtered, all in the name of liberation. And it did. There was a lot of bloodshed across the state of Virginia until Turner finally got caught and hanged. Again, slaveholders got scared, tightened the yoke. Garrison counteracted the intensity of the slave masters with an intensity of his own. He wrote a book that refuted colonizationists and gave birth to a new group called the American Anti-Slavery Society, AASS, a group of abolitionists. At the annual meeting of the AASS in May 1835, members decided to rely on the new technology of mass printing and an efficient postal service to overwhelm the nation with 20 to 50,000 pamphlets a week. Garrison began flooding the market with new and improved abolitionist information. Social media before social media, and slaveholders had no clue what was coming. A million anti-slavery pamphlets distributed by the end of the year. 